Dr. Brooks, wasn't there a calendar change in history? How can we know which is the Sabbath? You know, I get this question more than once, and it always amuses me a little bit. And here's why it amuses me. People who've been keeping Sunday all of their lives never feel mixed up. But the minute they hear the truth, they get mixed up. I don't understand it. And they don't understand it. You can't mix up Sabbath without mixing up Sunday. Would you say amen out there? If one's mixed up, the other's mixed up. But people aren't really mixed up. If I told you that I'm going to give you $1,000 on the seventh day of the week, you'd be there. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's not your problem. Now, was there a calendar change? Yes, there was. We live under what we call the Gregorian calendar. Pope Gregory was given credit for affecting this change in the year 1582. And here's what happened. Thursday was the 4th of October and Friday was the 15th. Ten days were taken out to make an adjustment in time. But Thursday was still followed by Friday and Friday was still followed by the Sabbath. The change did not affect the weekly cycle. Not only that, it cannot. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, I know that whatever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15. Thank you. Next, please. Mr. Brooks, suppose the days are all mixed up after all these centuries. <laughs> then how do we know which day is the Sabbath? Well, there's that question again. Mixed up. And beloved, it, it, I've already answered it, really. We're not mixed up until we hear the truth and then we look for excuses. Part of this is understandable. Folk have been doing a certain thing so long. And then they hear the truth. You know what happened to me? I was a Methodist. It happened to me and my family. Oh, dear ones, God doesn't send the truth to embarrass you or to offend you, but to enlighten you. And you, some of you, have to learn it just like I had to learn it. But it's not going to change for us. Amen? Amen. Ever since God made the Sabbath, Men have really known what it was. For whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Now, suppose you say, well, what about before history was written? I showed you the other night that Adam knew Methuselah for 243 years. Adam could tell Methuselah. Methuselah knew Shem for 100 years, and Shem was Noah's boy. And Methuselah died the year of the flood, but Shem had heard it from Methuselah for 100 years. And Shem knew Abraham. So in just three generations, all of that truth was passed along, but it wasn't written down. The first writer of history was not Herodotus, as they tell you in history, it was Moses. And he was inspired to write it. And when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Bible says they were in a wilderness and they couldn't buy food, so God rained down manna. He rained down what? He rained it down six days a week, and God said, gather enough on the sixth day to last on the Sabbath. And if you, if you do that, it'll stay fresh. But if some lazy rascal tried to gather enough on Tuesday to last all day Wednesday, the Bible said worms got in it and it stank. So what did God do for 40 years? He reestablished the rhythm of the weekly cycle. And the Jews have never left it since, nor have the Gentiles. We know which day is the seventh. If you don't, read your calendar, read your almanac, read your dictionary, read the encyclopedia, read the Bible. Next, please. Pastor, here's a person that wants to know, how can so many people be wrong about the Sabbath? Oh, I've answered that so many times. Please let it come through this time. If people went to the Bible, and the Bible only, every believer would be keeping the seventh day. Because that's the only one in here. Now, if that's clear, please say amen. amen. Let me give you another answer. For over 1,200 years, and we're going to preach about this on Saturday night. The subject is the truth about a wonderful lie, and it will be clear. I'm so glad truth is clear. You don't have to be confused unless you want to be. Would you say amen? amen? 
How many here don't want to be confused? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm talking to the right crowd, Pastor. Now, if you're here Saturday night, you will never wonder again. But during the dark ages, there was a great apostasy in the church. And the people were taught tradition instead of scripture. Tradition, the decisions of the church rather than scripture. And the world got into a bad habit. You do anything for 1,200 years, you get into a habit. And when the Reformation came, they only cast off certain things and clung to others. And that is the answer to your question. Next, please. Dr. Brooks, who was Michael? Was he Jesus? If so, is Jesus a created angel? The Bible refers to him as Michael the Archangel. Michael the Archangel. In both Testaments, in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 12, there was war in heaven, and Michael fought, and the dragon fought. There was a decisive battle fought in heaven between Michael, the archangel, and the dragon, which is Satan, according to verse 9 of that same chapter. I was preaching in Egypt, and there were some folk who said, this man believes that Christ was created. No, I don't. I believe Christ was the creator. I believe that he was God from eternity past and will be God for eternity future. Amen? Well, what about this Michael? First of all, before Christ became incarnate, that means in the flesh, in Bethlehem, before he was born and became the son of man, he manifested himself in the presence of an angel, but it was still Christ. It was Christ who met Joshua with a drawn sword. It was Christ who went before the children of Israel. But since he had not taken on flesh, it was difficult for them to understand that it was actually Christ. He was called the angel of the Lord. He was called the Lord of hosts, etc. Michael. I was accused of saying that in Egypt. And I uh, presented some rather uh, important uh, uh, and substantive answers. Michael. Michael is a compound word. El is a contraction of Elohim, which is the name of God. If you say Bethel, Bethel, it means house of God. Uh, Samuel, uh, Joel, always that E-L on the end of a word as a suffix indicates the name of God, Elohim. And so Michael in the original means one who is like God. Would you say amen? That's what Michael means. But he's called not an angel, but archangel. What does ark mean? Ark means ruler or king. If you say monarch, that means one king. Huh? If you say, uh, uh, use it in other terms, uh, the ark represents ruler or one who is supreme. So what the word means is one who is as God, who is king or leader of the angels. That's what Michael, the archangel, means. Christ is as God, and he is the ruler of angels. Next, please. Dr. Brooks, who are guardian angels? Who are they, what are they, and where are they? Well, the, first of all, they're invisible spirits. Angels are in this room right now. I wouldn't want to be in here if they were not. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 1.14 that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto them that shall be heirs of salvation. God has myriad angels, multiplied millions. One place it speaks of 10,000 times 10,000. That's a hundred million right there. And then it says in thousands of thousands, plenty of them. And they are involved in the work of salvation along with the Godhead. These angels are ministering spirits. They save your life when you don't even know it needs saving. These angels are around you, protecting you. The Bible says, the angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. I believe that. I remember one night, a gang of ruffians in a large city where I was doing evangelism in a big tent came and told the young man in charge of my tent, we are coming tonight, burn this thing down. Well, they didn't come. And several days later, one of them came along, and he had a very friendly attitude. 
And, and he came up to talk to the man, the young man that I had there. And, and I don't know why the young man asked, but he said, I thought you fellows would come by to burn the tent down. He said, we did come by, but you had all those men standing around the tent. Ladies and gentlemen, the angels of the Lord in camp round about them that fear him. Not only that, but Jesus said in Matthew 18, 10, be careful how you treat these little ones for they are angels. Always behold the face of the father, meaning that the guardian angel, even of a child, reports to the father how that child is being treated and led and taught or not taught. Angels, invisible spirits that attend God's people. Thank God for them. Next, please. Pastor, is it true that what you don't know won't hurt you? Yeah, I told you that somebody said to me once, I wish I hadn't heard the truth. Then I wouldn't be responsible. Oh, yes, you would. The Bible says in one place, Acts 17, 30, says at the times of this ignorance, God winks. When you don't know, God winks. But you better not hide behind that because Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But it doesn't stop there. It says, because thou hast rejected knowledge. And that's the key. There are some who reject knowledge. It isn't that they've never known or could not know. It's that God sends truth and sends them an invitation. You know what I believe with all my heart? I believe that when my workers pass out these handbills, every time they hand out one, the Holy Spirit is there saying to the person, you ought to come and hear this. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't do this work. I believe it. And people resist truth. You tell folk lies, they enjoy it. I think people like to be fooled. If I were up here fooling them, you couldn't get them in the church. Be so many of them. Not only that, do you know what I could do? I really believe this. I really believe this. I believe that I could come in before a large congregation and I could tell them an untruth and fool them and I could take up offerings and give some of it back and in a little while I'd be a millionaire. Do you hear what I said? It's happening all the time. Did you hear what I said? But when you tell them the truth, I don't know what it is in us that resists the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. Thy word is truth. Would you say amen? amen. Next, please. This is a sincere seeker by, by for the truth. Way, saying, is it true what you don't know won't hurt you? I buried a man once who had a spot on his lungs and didn't know it. This is a sincere seeker for truth, I believe, Pastor. And they're writing, the Bible says that Jesus went to hell and preached to the spirits there. Please explain, did this really happen? Well, always make sure that you know what the Bible says. It doesn't say that. It says he went and spoke to spirits in prison. And let, let me read one of them for you. There are two or three references that people refer to. You see, all of this is based on tradition. And because the Bible doesn't match tradition, even the Christians are not quoted correctly. So I'm going to 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going, no, 1 Peter 4, I think is the one I want to read. 1 Peter 4 and verse 6, there the Bible says, uh, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And some think Christ was preaching the gospel to dead people. That isn't what it means. It means he preached to people who were alive and who are dead now. When my daddy was living, I gave him a suit, amongst other things. And I could say today, I gave a suit to a man who is dead. Doesn't mean I gave it to him after he died. I gave it to him while he was living and he's simply dead now. That's all the text means. And the other one is found in 1 Peter 3, and you should begin around verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Christ was quickened or made alive by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto spirits in prison, not in hell, in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ preached to people in the prison house of sin through the Spirit. 
by that spirit that quickened him from the dead. And it was Noah who did the preaching, but the Holy Spirit made it clear to the minds of the people who were bound and imprisoned by sin. And that's all it says and all it means. Next, please. Mr. Evangelist, I've heard of people who say folks strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Is that in the Bible? <laughs> I am glad you want to know. The Bible is blamed for a lot of things that it does not say. But this expression, swallowing a gnat and gagging at a camel, is found in Matthew 23 and verse 24. It is in the Bible. Next, please. Why does the Bible say God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then God destroyed him? Please comment. Many Bible commentators will tell you that God is often blamed for what he does not uh, expressly forbid. If he allows a thing, then he's given credit for it. There's one place where it says God sent a lying spirit. Now, you know, God doesn't do that. What it meant was he did not stop it. And therefore, he was credited for it. And this question wants to know, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, let me tell you, God loved Pharaoh. And when he said to Moses, go tell him, let my people go. Moses said, well, who shall I tell him said it? God said, tell him I am said it. I am God. God is sending him a message. He has an opportunity to believe God. He has an opportunity to obey God. But because of his rebellion and his unbelief, he came to a point where his heart was hardened. I remember a way of explaining this that I perhaps used scores of years ago. You can take some wax and some wet clay and put them both in the sun. One will get hard while the other was melt. One will harden, the other will soften. It's the same sun. The problem is not in the sun. The problem is in the substance that is placed in the sun. Whenever you hear God's word and you decide not to do it, you are literally hardening your own heart. And you can come to the place where you cannot see, you cannot believe, you cannot understand. Next, please. Pastor, what does God say about healing preachers? I left some names off this because we don't want to call names. But if you will read, well, before that, let me tell you something. And I hope you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. God gave gifts to his church. And he didn't give everybody the same gifts. The gift of healing was a gift given to some, the Bible says. Not to everybody. And God never gave gifts gifts to men that they might profit thereby and build up huge personal treasuries. If you understand that, say amen. amen. It is not only sacrilege, it's blasphemy for men to become rich because of what God does. Now, God is a healer. I have been personally healed. I was over in Africa and I got sick. Now, I want to tell you, when those things hit you in these tropical countries, you are sick. It felt like knives had been thrust into me. And I looked at my watch and I had just about 23 minutes. No, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of something else. 40 minutes. 40 minutes before I would be picked up and carried to a pavilion to preach. And I didn't have access to anybody to pray for me except myself. And oh, it's good to know how to pray. You got to have a speaking acquaintance with the Lord for yourself. You might need to preach it sometimes and can't find it. Would you say amen? amen? And I remember talking to the Lord and I told him he understood how sick I was and what my responsibility was that night. Thousands were waiting on me. And I said, now, Lord, I have never missed a night because of sickness. I preach with the flu. I preach with temperature, but I've never missed a night. Now, I said to him, I'm not just interested in keeping a record going. I want to do your will. Now, if you want me to go and preach tonight, you've got to do something now. And just like you hit a light switch, all of it ended. And I went down there in the name of Jesus and preached. I've been healed. I believe in it. But everybody doesn't get healed. Uh-oh. Everybody doesn't get healed, did you hear what I said? And I'd like to prove it. The Bible says that Jesus healed Peter's uh, wife's mother. But there was a servant of God who was a preacher, an evangelist, who went everywhere preaching Christ. And he said, I had a thorn in the flesh. And I asked God to remove it three times. 
Do you know God actually told him not to pray about it anymore? God did not heal him. Who was that man? Of course it was Paul. And Paul, being enlightened, said, I rather therefore glory in my infirmity that the excellency might be of Christ and not of me. He said, lest I be exalted above measure. God left that thorn in the flesh there. If you want to read it, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and start, if you will, around 7 to 9 and you'll read it. Paul didn't get healed. God does it as he wills. And some folk would never live right if they hadn't been sick. Some never get on their knees till the burden is heavy on their shoulders. Some never look up to Jesus until they're flat of their backs. Thus, suffering becomes redemptive. It becomes a ministry. And then there are others whose faith reaches out and God heals them. But all this show that's put on for money is not of God. Next, please. Pastor Brooks, here's a young person who wants to know, when should people start dating? Goes on to say, nothing sexual, just dating. This is relative, and there are many answers that could be given. One is when you're old enough and mature enough. And you don't need to rush it. Your time will come. Nobody's trying to keep you away from it. It will come. But I want to tell you something. The longer you wait, the better you'll be. I, I remember when my daughter was growing up, she never asked. And, and I'm glad she didn't. I didn't have to deal with that. There was a group of about 12 of them that went everywhere together. One day I sent her a card with a bunch of bananas on the front. And I said, a banana only gets in trouble when it leaves the bunch. So it's actually better to put it off. Because there are certain pressures that come with dating. Realistically, your bodies are young and operating at peak efficiency. You are not ready for certain pressures. So put it off until you're old enough and smart enough to deal with it. Now, one of the answers when you're old enough and mature enough. Another is when your parents say so. Let them have their parental role. And eventually the time will come. And if you have kept yourself pure, you will thank God and your marriage will be off to a good start. Be worth it. Next, please. Pastor, this one's a little long. In Matthew 5, 19, where it says, shall be one of the least commandments, shall teach men so, shall be called the least in heaven. Will he be in heaven, called the least, or will he be on earth? <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's go to school. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. What is sin? Breaking God's law. Now another text says, the wages of sin is sin. Now a person wants to know, because Jesus said, whoever breaks one and teaches others is called least in the kingdom of heaven. They want to know, does that mean he'll get there only to be called least? Oh, no, 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 no. You're not going up there with sin. Let me tell you, Jesus and angels and the Father discuss us. Job wasn't in heaven, and God said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? They had been talking about Job up in heaven. Amen? Amen? Well, if a man does and teaches God's commandments, the Bible says, Matthew 5, 17 and 19, all of that. The Bible says he is called great in the kingdom of heaven. But if he teaches men not to obey God, when the Father and the Son and the angels mention him up there, he's the least thing that walks the earth. But he's on earth. You can believe that. Next, please. Pastor, do you believe we should pray to saints? Well, no, I do not believe that. And the Bible does not teach that. We are not to pray to any human being. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. Now that's explicit language. You don't have to stumble over that. It doesn't require interpretation. This is English, my mother tongue, and most of you speak English, the, and those who don't are having it interpreted. Listen, the Bible says there is one God and one mediator. How many? One, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Right. 
Amen? Amen. So you don't have to pray to another human being. The Bible says rather in Hebrews 4.16, come boldly to the throne of grace. You'll find mercy to help in time of need. When you need a Savior, there is a Savior living at the throne of God who hears and answers prayer. You don't have to go through any other mediator. There is one God, one mediator, even Christ Jesus. Please explain to us Matthew 19, 24. Is it impossible for a rich man to be saved? Well, of course not. That text says it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to be saved. And some conclude, therefore, that it must be impossible for a rich man to be saved. Well, let me tell you, many of the Bible characters who love God were fabulously rich. Abraham was. And so was Isaac, and so was Jacob. They were very, very rich. Joseph of Arimathea was rich. Nicodemus was rich. I read a book by the, a man by the name of Babson, an economist. He said Nicodemus ben Gurion could support the entire city of Jerusalem 10 years out of his own pocket. And he estimated it would take a billion dollars a year. So Mr. Nicodemus was a billionaire many times over. So it's not a sin to be rich. Then what does this text mean? Easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye. One of the simplest explanations is this. The city of Jerusalem had main gates where the caravans went through, the camels, the horses, the chariots. But there were also some small pedestrian gates. They were narrow and small and were called needle's eyes. Now if a man came with a camel laden, ordinarily he'd go through one of the main gates. But was it possible for a camel to get through a pedestrian gate called a needle's eye? The answer, frankly, is yes. In order to get him through, first thing he had to do was unload him. Then get him on his knees. And if you unloaded that rascal and got him on his knees, he could squeeze through. A rich man can make it if he will unload and give a part of his blessing to the poor and to the work of God, unload and get on his knees, he can be saved. There's going to be plenty of them up there.